Hey, welcome back to The Few Show, everybody. My name is Bud. I'm an account executive here at Xfusion.io and co-host of The Few Show. I'm excited to be joined today by my guest, Patrick Jacobs. Patrick is the co-founder of Immerse. He is an entrepreneur, dad of three, husband to one, musician and skier. Patrick went to school in Colorado and somehow landed in cable TV. He worked for Showtime after college and left to help launch Mav TV, which was later sold to Lucas Oil. He was then connected with his co-founder, uh, who was hatching Immerse. There were several pivots before they found their niche and groove. They just secured seed financing after several years of bootstrapping and are hopefully looking at a hefty 12 to 18 months. Patrick, thanks for being on the show. It's great to have you, buddy. Yeah, well, great to be on with you. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, for having me. So, yeah. All right, man. Well, let's let's kind of start with that background. We'll get into a, a immerse here in, in just a few minutes, but uh, that that's quite a background in in TV. You you were in Colorado at Regis Jesuit, and how did you end up landing at Showtime, and and what were you doing there? Like this is back in the day. A, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly when I was studying didn't have any designs on getting into the cable TV business by any means. Um, I actually answered an ad in the newspaper, in the Denver Post. I mean, that's back when that's how you got jobs, right? Is, you know, right. reading somebody's hiring and uh, ended up getting the job. Uh, it was a, obviously entry level, kind of my first real job out of college. Um, and, you know, I really liked it. It was interesting. Um, it, it was kind of a sales and marketing uh, gig uh, and an opportunity uh popped up to, to move down to Dallas, uh, which I was not doing cartwheels about, uh, to be frank. But if I wanted to kind of stay with the company, this was a great opportunity to be able to move down to their Dallas office, a little bit more responsibility and, and kind of take things from there. And, uh, and so I did that. I hated to leave Denver and the skiing and the mountains and the climate and all of that. Uh, but uh, I grew up in Oklahoma City. This was a chance to get a little bit closer to home. Um, and I had some friends down here, so it made things a little bit easier. Uh, and continued on with Showtime and really had a, a, a nice kind of trajectory towards a, a long-term career if, if I wanted it. And um, there was a bit of a shakeup uh, at, at Showtime. The industry, the cable industry had started to consolidate. Um, and so they were kind of restructuring some people and, and that sort of unpleasant um, part of the business. And uh, four colleagues uh, that I was pretty close with ended up leaving and uh, wanted to start their own cable network. Um, and it was a network that was going to be kind of focused on like, you know, guy stuff, motor sports, action sports, things like that. Uh, and asked me if I was interested in, 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 in joining them uh, once they kind of had gotten, you know, kind of the tent poles in place. And at the time, um, I had gotten married, but didn't have kids yet. Uh, my wife was um, still is an attorney, um, was doing well in her, you know, kind of the beginnings of, of her career. And if there was ever a chance and, you know, for me to go and do something like a startup, this was kind of it. And I'd always in the back of my mind wanted to do something like that, but didn't have the idea of kind of what that would be. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity to be able to do that. So jumped on uh, with, with them and uh, over the next, you know, five to six years, we built this network, um, got involved with Lucas Oil. Uh, they came in as an, as an equity partner and, and ultimately ended up buying it. And it was, uh, you know, so a great, great success story. And I always laugh because uh, when, you know, people ask, what, you know, what's, what's the biggest highlight of your career? What's the best thing that has happened and, and the worst thing? And in some regards, they're one and the same. I mean, obviously, having that exit event with, with Lucas was, was great. Um, but that was my first kind of foray into entrepreneurship and startup. And the stars kind of aligned and the timing was right. And we had the right market to work in. And, you know, a big company came in and, and, and bought us. And so it gave me, kind of, I think, a bit of a false sense of reality of just how difficult what we had kind of done really is and that replicating such a thing is, uh, is, is really, really challenging. So, um, you know, I left there, but kind of thinking like, this stuff's easy, right? I mean, you start a company, you kind of run it, you build it, and, you know, then somebody buys it and on to the next. And so in between kind of where I ended up with Immerse and my exit from, from MAV TV, 
uh, we tried to start another network, me and another partner. Uh, I was focused on my kids' uh, programming. And by that point, I'd had a couple of, of kids and thought, this is a great area to be in, like live action kids entertainment. And again, the, uh, the industry kind of consolidated. And I realized really quickly that like raising money is really, really hard. Um, building a business from scratch is really, really, really hard. Um, and it, you know, it ended up not ultimately going anywhere. Um, and so I spent a lot of time, probably longer than I'd like to admit, kind of chasing that just because I, again, in the back of my mind was like, this is, you can do this. This isn't that difficult. Right. But, um, but it is, it's, it's, it's really, really, really hard. And, you know, now looking back on it, I realized just how fortunate we were with Mav TV. But once I kind of put that to bed and then I had another, uh, stint for about a year, uh, helping uh, a guy start a. Uh, an e-commerce business that was really focused on outdoor gear uh, to where you could write content about getting outside and exploring and kind of doing that that fun stuff. And then we were going to kind of outfit people with the right kind of niche gear to be able to do um, to do those activities. And again, um, it, it ultimately ran out of steam. Um, and that was when Arthur and I ended up uh, getting connected. And, um, and Arthur uh, had just kind of launched what was going to become kind of immerse. Uh, but it was really at a place where it was trying to kind of find what it was going to ultimately turn into. But at the very beginning of immerse, uh, it's always been about live video and that mm -hmm. the live video would become a bigger factor in commerce. Um, but ultimately where, where, where immerse started was, uh, more in content monetization. So if you were a yoga teacher, um, if you were a guitar instructor, if you were a chef, if you were a, a lecturer, if you had content that you thought people would subscribe to, then the platform was great for you to be able to go live, collect money and, you know, and profit off that type of content. And what we found was it, it was really going to be kind of hard to scale. Um, and it was going to take a lot of time and a lot of money to be able to kind of market that. And so kind of our first pivot was, um, towards influencer marketing. And it was like, okay, there's people that are posting on Instagram, making, you know, thousands of dollars just for mentioning a product and taking a picture with a, a bottle of skin cream or whatever that may be. What if we could use live video and make it a little bit more authentic and engaging? And what if we could really leverage our platform to marry brands and influencers and let them use Immerse as the live platform to be able to do that? And people got really pretty excited about it. Um, but what we were finding was that dealing with influencers was a nightmare, right? <laughs> as you can, as you can imagine, yeah. um, and that we were turning more into like an agency than we were a tech platform. And ultimately, that's what we wanted to be. We wanted to provide this, you know, this kind of live video and and as a, as a software as a service. So, how Immerse, as we know it today, really got hatched was we were having lunch with the president of uh, a company called Lucchese. Lucchese is a pretty well-known uh, cowboy boot company and make very high-end seven, $800 pairs of cowboy boots. Um, we were talking to them initially about this influencer model, but during the course of our lunch with them, something kind of triggered that light bulb um, that was the, the, the president of, Luke, of, of Luke Casey said, you know, we spend so much time and money driving traffic to our website, right? And we try to write copy and have 360 imagery and have like, you know, a chat bot and things like that. But at the end of the day, somebody pulling the trigger on a $800 pair of cowboy boots online, that's a pretty big leap of faith. And at the same time, we've got these score, these stores kind of scattered across the Southwest part of the country that are often void of traffic. You know, there's a lot of downtime. And if there was a way that we could connect our online shoppers with our in-store sales associates and make that connection happen and let them kind of shop along each with each other, that would be amazing. And, you know, Arthur and I kind of looked at each other, I remember driving back to the office uh, after that and could not wait to get to the whiteboard and be like, this is it. Like we finally kind of found a purpose for what this can do, because this has to be a problem, you know, across retail in general for, yeah. for all merchants. And that ultimately is how what Immerse is today kind of came to fruition. So I'm happy to kind of get into how, you know, the, the, the Lucchese use case and, and, and all of that. But if you've got questions on 
stuff leading up to that. I'm happy to address those too. Well, I was, I was gonna, gonna unpack a couple things in there. Yeah. Um, first, I, I was sure that you were going to say, you know, in, in, in that, that your, your favorite thing or, or the thing that you liked the most in your career was, was your uh, series on Oki, Oki noodling. Um, <laughs> but uh yeah <laughs> um yeah but that, i mean but, those... but your favorite thing was was selling was selling uh, <laughs> mav tv but yeah you know that's just <laughs> catching catfish with your hands or selling the company i mean it was a toss-up uh, but yeah no i went with uh with with, with the latter yeah <laughs> did did you actually did you actually try and and go noodling with that show yeah. no. oh that's a bummer so, that's a bummer there you, was you a... just produced it yeah, I mean, so there was a there was a, a documentary that came out called Oki Noodling, and it was very popular, like on PBS. And you know, I grew up in Oklahoma, and so it was a Oklahoma kind of based film. But it was about these guys that would go and just like catch these giant catfish, like the size of like toddlers, out of these godforsaken riverbeds in Oklahoma. I watched and just it. Hands into a hole, you know. I mean, it's it's insane. It's it's absolutely insane. <laughs> So oh, I I'm, somehow I'm was able through, to through, grow buddy. up in the same part of town as the guy who had done the movie, a guy named Bradley Beasley. And I got connected with Bradley and we kind of were starting at, at MAV TV to think of original pictures and like we really need to start getting like some original content going. I was like, I'm, I've got the most unlikely sequel in cinematic history. What if we did Oki Noodling 2? And I reached out to, to Bradley and um, he actually too had thought it would be interesting to go back and kind of revisit some of these very colorful characters from seven, eight years in the earlier. And so, yeah, we lined up the financing. We got, we got Bradley some money. He went and shot it. And that was ultimately the first and only Mav TV original film was <laughs> Oki Newland too. But I, uh, I was invited uh, to go and did not take him up on that. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that your, your highlight was, was selling Mav TV and, and not yeah. noodling with with the okies buddy um but but back to reality um with with immerse and and specifically like like new casey and and your case study there uh you, you started this in in 2018 if i'm not mistaken yep. when when did that kind of light bulb moment hit was that pre-pandemic and yeah, yeah. okay so yeah when when you started kind of bringing bringing your niche mm -hmm. together and and figuring this whole thing out your pre-pandemic when the pandemic hit what does that do for, for this whole this whole immerse thing right right well you know a little good and a little bad right i mean the good part is, is it absolutely shown a bright light on this type of technology and the need, you know, and e-commerce is, you know, just absolutely booming in March of, 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 of 2020 uh, when things, the world shuts down basically, right? And everybody's buying mm -hmm. things online. Um, and so it showed, you know, it really put a spotlight on this type of technology. We were not quite there yet, right, to be able to take advantage of that um in like kind of a, a a big way i mean obviously the bad part besides <laughs> the the death and the, and the, sure. and the pandemic and, and all of that was that uh you know financing dried up we were about kind of where we were ready to start to raise some money that became very difficult and then the retailers and the brands that we were engaging with and talking about this and they were loving this pre-pandemic you know they went into survival mode right we just got to keep the lights on. We got to just work on the blocking and tackling of just like selling product. Um, this is sounds great, but we don't have the time to kind of onboard and to train. And we just got to try to kind of be in survival mode. So it definitely set us back. We launched with Lucchese kind of the, you know, the MVP that we had kind of built for Lucchese in December of 2019. So about three, okay. four months before, before uh, the pandemic hit. We'd rolled it out to all their stores. Um, it was going fantastic. We were getting all the KPIs that we were needing to see to, to kind of verify that, yes, people want to use this. Yes, there's a benefit for the customer. 
but also obviously for the brand and the retailer uh, that they're seeing all the metrics that they would want you know, to be able to see through those. Um, we were getting that in the early part of 2020. And then the pandemic hits and what was great about what we had for Luke Casey was the ability for their sales associates to not be furloughed or let go, but they could actually use our app from their houses and apartments to where people that were shopping online could click the widget and said, shop live with us. It would ring the app that would, you know, again, it would be like me answering the call here in, in my home office um, and allow them to be able to shop along with them and answer the questions that these online customers have. So it was a great story from that standpoint um, of really um, allowing Luke Casey to conduct their online business in a much more innovative way and be really ahead of the curve um, in some of the things that, the, that they were doing. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, save, you know, quite a few jobs. Of, of, of yeah, absolutely. As well. So great story from, from that standpoint. Yeah. Um, so after Luke Casey hits, right, the, the next thing is how, well, how do we, you know, and again, getting back to those affirmative kind of metrics that we felt like we needed to see to really invest the capital to let's move forward with this project. Uh, but we saw that customers were using it, like a high rate of customers were clicking on the widget and we're like, what is this thing? I've never seen this. And basically what it is, is it's a widget that says shop live with us or shop live. Mm -hmm. Click that, you enter your name, you can enter either live video or live chat. And um, from that point, it rings the app on the sales associate's phone who is either in, in one of their physical stores or like we just talked about, could be at their house. Um, and then once that kind of connection's made, it really is this cool co-shopping experience where um, you're able to, as a customer, get the questions that you have about a particular product answered and then allow the sales associate to really guide you through, you know, making sure that you get the right, the right product. And so what we saw was big sales conversions, right? Like one in every three of these connections were resulting in sale. And typically, you know, sales conversion rates in e-commerce are, you know, in the single, low single digit, 1%, 2%, anything north of that is a huge sales conversion. So for us to be hovering around that 30 to 33% was really unheard of. Um, we saw a big lift in average order value too. So, you know, that really kind of, uh, when you were able to plug in kind of a, a human associate into that sales process online, where how about a, how about a belt? How about a shirt? How about, you know, uh, the upsell and, and all of that, mm -hmm. that the average order value was, was going up to, uh, pretty significantly, like in the 60% range. And then the last thing that we were really paying close attention to was the return rate, right? You know, just. The hypothesis is if I can connect and answer your questions, there should be a much lower likelihood that you're going to return that product if I can get the right product in your hands the first time. And so we saw return rates going down by 25%. And so once that kind of happened, we were like, man, this I, th I think we've got something. So then it's like, okay, we'll go to market. Like, how are we, you know, how, how do we, you know, kind of get this out to, to the masses? And so we spent the last uh, kind of the, the, the last couple of months of last year and then the, really the, the, the first part of, of, of 2021 um, focused on getting integrated with Shopify. Um, and Shopify made sense for us to really use as our kind of, you know, launch pad um, in terms of kind of a go-to-market just because of A, the sheer volume, right? Uh, they have so many merchants, you know, over a million merchants that, that, are, that are, you know, right there, um, you know, potential customers for us. Uh, and there really wasn't anything like what we were doing that was existing kind of in their app marketplace. So it, it made a lot of sense. There's a lot of work to get there, uh, but we launched uh, in, in the Shopify app store uh, about a month ago, I guess. So, um, you know, at this point, we've really got it, I think, in a position to, to, to hopefully be able to, to scale. Nice. And <clears throat> speaking of scaling, you're you're doing that pretty well so far um from what i understand you have about 20 or so clients and and you're working on more correct yeah i mean what's great about the shopify piece of it is once we kind of get you know once it's there right and people start mm -hmm. kind of hearing about it and we're doing some advertising and things like that to draw attention to it but really it can become almost a, a, a business that kind of runs itself because sure 
to get started with Immerse, it used to be there was a bit of a heavy lift of integration because we 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 plug into your product catalog, we plug into your recently viewed history, we plug into um, you know your wish list and your shopping cart um, product variants and all of that, and so. Unless it was, if it was outside of the Shopify ecosystem, that was kind of a manual effort. Well, now it's really plug and play to where you can go, you can go to the app store, you can install the app, and all that happens instantaneously behind the scenes. So one of the coolest things over the last kind of couple of weeks that started to happen is like waking up in the morning and like, oh, somebody installed our app, and I have no idea who this person is. I haven't put them in some email sequence or reached out to them by phone or, you know, spent a bunch of time and effort trying to get them convinced that this would be a great product for them. They just found us. And so we're seeing that start to ramp up. Um, nice. That happened actually just right before we talked that we had another install today. So we're starting to see that really you know, happen with more of kind of a small business and boutiques um, that are on Shopify. Maybe they have a single store um, because at the end of the day, Immerse is really grounded in, are you a brand that wants to build a relationship with your online customer? And if so, mm -hmm. there's no better way to do that than, than through us. Now, there are some brands out there that that is not important, right? I mean, if I'm buying mm -hmm toilet paper, you know, paper towels online. I just want the most frictionless path to be able to purchase, which is Amazon, right? Just go click. Right. Ads, but I don't have any questions about that. But if I've got a piece of jewelry, if I've got a skincare product, if I've got an $800 pair of cowboy boots, if I've got a couch, uh, a piece of art, whatever that may be, and I want to be able to ask some questions about that, then, you know, it, it, the, there's, like I said, no, no better way to, to, to be able to, to really do that. Okay, so I was going to ask that, um, and the, and you kind of answered that already. It, it says fully customized app for sales associates. Yes. Now, in, in the early days, did you have a team that just really worked with with like Luke Casey and just customized each individual piece for them? And, and now we Shopify's kind of like yeah. they're kind of doing that on the Shopify app for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so Luke Casey was 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 great. I mean, they are still our largest client. Uh, we would not be in business today if it was not for them, because um, we were kind of learning as we went with them, right? I mean, we both agreed like this would be awesome if we can make this happen, and they kind of relied on us to build the tech. And listen, there were some you know ups and downs, and okay, well this didn't work or that didn't, you know, like I mean, we were just literally building this kind of on the fly for them. Um, but yeah, so once, you know, we kind of got them as a use case and knew kind of how we needed to do that, then the onboarding process with Shopify uh, became really simple. Um, and so everything is branded. So if you are a brand, if you are, you know, if you have, you know, Bud's dress shop or whatever, um, and you go there and you go to the app store, you're able to pick your colors, you're able to, you know, change the wording of, of things and really kind of customize the look and feel of the app to where it feels like it doesn't feel like an Immerse app. It feels like a Bud's Dress, you know, shop yeah. app or a Lucchese app or whatever. Yeah. Um, and within that app, again, all of your products are there to where if you click the widget as a customer, I can see the items that you viewed before you started that. So I immediately know, um, you know, okay, you know, Bud's looking at this particular pair of cowboy and then if it's chat i can be chatting back and you know we can chat back and forth and i can be sharing products and suggesting products right oh you have a wide foot this boot would be great for you because it's got a you know a wider toe bed and i can sit you know send that to you and that becomes something that you can click on and immediately add to the cart and as a sales associate i can add that stuff to your cart as well so it's really like being kind of in the store with that person you obviously can't try on the product but short of that all the other functionality and kind of that missing human element that just inherently is not there with e-commerce. We're trying to kind of restore that as, 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 as much as we can. Um, and so we're seeing right now, we, we, we had launched initially just with the live video piece. I mean, if you remember when we first started talking, we were born out of live video and the belief that yeah, live video absolutely. would become more and more prevalent. And 
it's still easier to for me to sell you a pair of cowboy boots if we're engaged like we are right now and I can look at you and I can show you stuff than it would be if we were texting back and forth and I was sending, you know, chatting products. Um, it still converts at a higher level, but customers are more used to live chat at this point. And so what we're seeing is about 80 to 85% of all of our engagements start in chat first, right? And only, you know, 15 to 20% start in live video. So the customer likes the chat um, element of it. And we're seeing brands that we're working with do a really good job of transitioning those customers from chat to video because within our app, you can literally click the video icon and then boom, we're right there and we're, we're in chat and then you can go for we're in video and then you can go back to chat. Um, so, you know, all of that piece uh, is really kind of gotten, you know, in place and secured with a lot of the testing being done and over the, you know, the past years with Luke Casey. Um, and, and now, now, like I said, we, we, we kind of got it in the app store to where it's available for the masses. Um, and now it's really for us about uh, awareness. You know, I, I don't come from the retail space. Uh, Co-founder Arthur, who really runs the product and more the kind of tech side, he doesn't come from the retail or brand space. Um, so we don't have a big Rolodex where we can pick up and call, you know, brand A through Z and say, hey, you should really try this for us. That's been our biggest challenge, right? Um, and now with the seed financing that we were that, that we were able to raise, uh, we're able to do that, start marketing it, and you know, really spend the next, you know, this kind of this holiday season, and then the first part of next year, uh, driving as much awareness within the Shopify ecosystem uh, to this as as we possibly can. Nice. I, I am going to say this: like you, you keep taking all my questions away in in the answers that you're already given so i don't, I don't know where we're gonna <laughs> where we're gonna keep going <laughs> with this conversation sorry <laughs> that's okay that's okay um but uh that being said um i i, I would like to go <clears throat> kind of this way my one of my questions was going to be like like what's what's one of your biggest pain points and, and you said that neither of you are from the retail space and so you kind of didn't know you didn't know which way which way to go with that um no you no. you did you do have a, a b to c um platform here but do you see this going kind of like a, a b to b uh direction as well like, can you kind of pivot this to go in a, in a B2B way? Yeah, for sure. And that's been some conversations that are really starting to happen now because, you know, I mean, retail is, uh, physical retail is not dead. In fact, it, it, it's, it's starting to kind of thrive and it's, it's evolving or whatever, but brands are still going to be trying to sell their products wholesale. Now, there's been a big change over the last, you know, six, seven years of going direct to consumer, right? And pulling back from retail, because if I have a brand, I want to control the brand message. I want to, you know, have those nice healthy margins that I get if you buy the product directly from me, instead of buying it from the retailer, obviously that's more money in my pocket. But the wholesale business is still going to going to exist. And so um, the ability for like a Lucchese, right? Who still is in, you know, thousands of retailers across the country of, of you know, Western wear retailers and whatever, right. um, to be able to use Immerse to have those wholesale orders placed um, makes a, a lot of sense. And so, you know, we're, we're the, the, the biggest thing that you can, I think, do wrong at this stage is to start kind of being like, well, what's over here, you know, and not kind of taking your all eye off the ball with, with the Shopify piece. But I absolutely think that, and, you know, a couple of years when, when we wake up that we will see that we're, we're getting involved more in, in the B2B side in terms of helping people place wholesale orders and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, no doubt. Nice. So let me ask you, this is kind of still in, in your wheelhouse as in kind of video and, and, and things like that, but how do you bridge some of your uh, past experience in unrelated fields to what you're doing now like how do you bring some of your your old your old self into into what you're doing yeah um 
I think less than less from a cable kind of standpoint, because obviously the production value and things like that at Showtime is, is much, 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 much different. Um, but I think one area where I've been able to glean some insights that are, that are helpful was in that short foray and kind of that e-com business that I was helping with where we, you know, b- before I got on with the Morris. Our biggest issue was we would have people that would come to our website, right? And we had beautiful content, great photography. We had a great team of writers out in the field in Alaska that were writing about, you know, Denali and I mean, all sorts of just really, really, really high quality content. And I had managed to help us get relationships and start to start selling some really high quality gear that you couldn't necessarily find online. You had to kind of look for it uh, to see. But what we were finding was happening was that people were coming to the website, they were reading our content, engaging with us, and then they were going to that brand and just buying the product directly from them. The price was the same, Mm. but they would go and buy it directly from, you know, the actual brand. And that's ultimately what kind of sunk us was that, you know, we're never going to, our biggest competition are the brands that we are selling their products, right? And that was kind of the irony of the whole thing is like, we can't compete with the brands that we're, we're selling because people are going to their website and getting more information than just placing the order there from them. So that was when the whole Luke Casey thing started to happen. That, that I was really able to harken back to that and be like, listen, this direct consumer thing and, and brands really wanting to build lasting relationships and drive that lifetime value of a customer, um, this can help them do that. And there is, you know, a, a ton of value in providing that type of tool for, for these people. So that's the biggest thing from kind of my past life that I think I've been able to tap into. Um, and I, I just person from a personal standpoint, love these brands that are just kind of trying to, you know, hey, notice me, buy from me. Um, I've got an innovative product or I'm doing this a little bit different connecting with those types of founders and just kind of hearing their, their story and their challenges and how we can help them um, is really, really cool. I mean, this morning I went and I had coffee uh, with a, uh, a lady who's got a, a beauty product that is just kind of getting started, uh, but they're, they've got some traction. Um, and she was just really, really, really taken aback by just how great this would be that she, you know, cause she doesn't have a physical store. So the only way that she can connect with her customers is through her website and all that's been to date is just like an email or you know potentially a phone call or maybe they're able to coordinate like a facetime consultation and for her to be able to place this little widget on their website that really opens up the entire you know a, a, a store for her um mm-hmm. you know to where she can be face to face with one of her customers um like she's super excited about and so for us to be able to provide that for these small businesses um, you know, it's one thing for, you know, a, you know, six, seven figure, you know, seven, eight figure business to be able to launch this stuff. It's completely sure. different for kind of the mom and pops, right, that are, you know, able to kind of get these tools. And through Shopify, we've been able to, you know, price it to where it's affordable for, for, for all these people, too. So, you know, it's it's it, that's kind of the, the biggest joy I get out of out of this right now is helping these people launch this really innovative stuff that's really simple to use. So that's a good feeling. Yeah. Well, I, and I'm sitting here thinking like my, my daughter works for her uh, boyfriend. Oh, I'll just call him her fiance. He, he hasn't asked yet, but he's got the ring and he's going to right. Right. Um, right. her, her fiance's Does mom. Does she know this? I hope has... she's not going to see this and you're going to spoil, yeah. spoil this. No, she, she knows it. <laughs> she knows it um she and every day she's like when am i getting it she's like yep. just wait when i'm ready <laughs> she's right, like right. well i'm ready <laughs> you know, so um but he, she has a little a little country feed and seed store and 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 a little clothing store that has has western wear and, and stuff like that i live in the northeast corner of colorado yep. and i'm like yep. man this would be this would be a fantastic thing i don't know if her mom would be interested in because I mean, she's busy making shirts and stuff. So I don't know if she'd be interested in, in doing an online thing. That'd be another yeah. thing, but I'm like, man, this would be a great, you know, this would be a great case scenario for her. Yeah. 
Well, to do. you know, if she doesn't have an online, Shopify makes it so easy, right? I mean, for just like, you know, a couple of dollars a month, really, you can go and build a website. It can be very basic. They've got all sorts of tools that you can use like us, right? Um, and we've mm -hmm. got, a, you know, our basic chat um, functionality. Um, it's like 50 bucks a month, right? So it's it, mm -hmm. like, it, it's, it, it's very affordable. Um, and you can just kind of start with a single user, just only doing chat and at least feel like you're connected to your customer. And they're not just, you know, kind of these, you know, people that are out there that are just kind of left to their own devices to navigate their store and find what they want and, and all of that. So, yeah, I mean, again, we've, we've tried to make it to where it's a, it's a good fit for, for brands of all sizes. Um, you know, the only really requirement is, are you a brand that cares about building a relationship with your customer? And is the product that you're selling something that could benefit from some explanation, some from some guidance, yeah. you know, um, and whether again, that's a piece of jewelry or that's the type of feed to give to your cattle, um, you know, they're they're one in the same, um, you know, I've got questions and, and now those can be answered in real time by a real person who, you know, either owns the business or, or knows the products inside and out. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So let me ask you this, you're kind of at the forefront of this, there's not there's not too many people that are doing this, maybe a couple. Um, so where, where do you think that this industry falls short? What do you see as the future of digital commerce and, and where do you see this thing going in the next few years? Yeah. Yeah. I think that the next, you know, call it five years or whatever, are going to be really, really exciting. And what, you know, I mean, it, it, this is also kind of new. It doesn't really have a word for it. We call it live commerce. Uh, the product that I'm talking about um, is we kind of call digital clienteling. We do have a live streaming product too, which we don't have time to really get into. Uh, they're kind of more one to many where you can kind of broadcast your own QVC type shows from your, from your website. Um, but I see that at least for us um, and, and kind of what our product roadmap is, is to really be able to provide much more data back to the brand. So we track all the sales and everything. So you can go on your immersed dashboard once you're set up and see how many calls came in, see what the customer engagement was, see how many sales you made, if anything was refunded, um, and really kind of measure and track your success with using the tool. As we kind of mature and get more, um, you know, points of data that we can share with people. What are the products that people are talking about, you know, during these chats and can share that with people. Um, if this person has looked at X, Y, and Z product and then starts this chat, can we use some AI to be able to suggest products because of, you know, past history of you need to suggest this product. It's great for the you know, the human brain to be able to be there and we're, we're, we're going back and forth with the shopping experience. But if I, as an associate, could look at my phone and be able to hit a button and suggest three products that I know from a data standpoint, the customer has a higher propensity to buy just because of the products that they've been looking at, you know, that type of kind of smart selling, um, I think is really kind of the next thing for us to be able to, 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 to bring to the table. We've got the basic tenets right in place of right. just kind of connect, engage, sell. I mean, that, you know, kind of, but now it's like, how, how, how can we kind of dress this up and, and make that process um, even, even better? And there's going to be more and more companies like us coming out of the woodwork. Um, I, I see it happening all the time, right? Um, and, and because, because of the pandemic in a lot of ways, I, I like to think that even if that hadn't happened, that this would still kind of be the, 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 the trend, but that, you know, again, uh, with e-commerce going from, you know, 10% of all goods purchased to 25% of all goods purchased um, in about a 90 day period really changed the game and accelerated a lot of these technologies like ours that were, you know, before the pandemic kind of nice to have, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's not a big priority. It sure would be great to have that at some point to, a must have, like we've got to have this because we've got to be able to engage and shop with our customers in, in this type of type of fashion. So it'll be interesting to see where it all kind of shakes out, but 
it's not going anywhere. Uh, we're certainly no, definitely not. Uh, ahead of the curve, I think, uh, which is good and bad. Um, you know, we, we, we are partners up with Gartner and they have their, you know, kind of keywords and where they see things going. And when you look at kind of the curve of where, you know, we're at in terms of kind of consumer adoption, we're way out there, right? So the good thing is, is that we've got, I think a lot of, you know, opportunity uh, ahead of us. It's just, you know, when does that opportunity, you know, when do those customers kind of catch up to where we're at? So that's, that will be an interesting thing to follow here over the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to start kind of winding this thing down. Yeah. And you've got yeah. a, you've got a meeting here real soon, but just real quick uh, before we do that, you, you started this thing off with by bootstrapping um, and now you're, you're going for some funding. Why, why did you start? bootstrapping instead of going for funding right away was there a reason for that or was it just well didn't want to part, i mean part of it was we had luxury of being able to self-fund it um for one and so to kind of protect that early equity uh was 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 nice it's not like we weren't trying to, <laughs> to raise money we just weren't gotcha. being real successful because this from a concept conceptual standpoint it was like, yeah, this makes sense, but go get some customers and let's kind of see. And then like the Lucchese thing, we built a kind of custom for them. And then there was always a reason for an investor to kind of say, well, get back with us in six months. Let's kind of see where you're at. As it so happened to turn out, the lead investor of this round is the chairman of Lucchese, which is very, you know, solid affirmation of the product, I think, that he personally believes in what we've done and can see what we've done for their business that he was willing to, you know, write a big check uh, to really lead lead the funding. And once he got on, That's awesome. um, you know, the rest kind of kind of came came in came into place. And you know, uh, so uh, again, part of it was the luxury of being able to kind of bootstrap it and, and protect that 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 equity. Um, and then we kind of got to the point where we needed to raise some money so that we could really increase our monthly burn and start you know, hiring some people and being able to go out and really market this in a more kind of meaningful way. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Just wondering, is there's, there's some people that yeah. just are funding all the way. There's some people that are bootstrapping all the way. That was just yeah. a quick question. All right. Last couple of questions before we uh, wrap this thing up. I asked these yep. two questions to everybody that's on this show. Uh, yep. What advice would you give to founders or soon to be founders that are going to be watching this program? Uh, I, I think that the, the number one piece is to um, find people that you enjoy working with. I mean, assuming that you're not just going to kind of go out and do it on your own. And if you are, then hopefully you like yourself. But for those that are, you know, working with a co-founder or a group of co-founders, um, really make sure that you, from a personal standpoint, and from a and that you complement each other in terms of your skill set that you find the right people because listen there's going to be so many ups and downs um, and you've got to have a partner that you know that that you can be honest with uh, when things are tough that you can celebrate with when things are going well um, but that you know uh, that that you both have this the the, the right kind of mentality and so I, I think that as I've kind of done these things. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to find good people to do them with. Sometimes they don't work out, but it, it certainly entrepreneurship can be very rewarding, but it can also be very mis miserable too um, at, at certain times. And to you know that whole misery loves company, right? You got to make sure that you've got people that you can kind of be a little bit miserable with and enjoy being being with them. So I think beyond product and market fit and all of that, just relationships and having people that you like um, is is critical. Nice. And then uh, what's the best way for our viewers to get in touch with you if they so choose? Yeah, perfect. So I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, just Patrick Jacobs at, on LinkedIn. You can go to Immerse, I-M-M-E-R-S-S, -S, send an inquiry there. Um, and then from an email standpoint, just uh, P Jacobs, J-A-C-O-B-S at Immerse.com. That's I-M-M-E-R-S-S.com. So, yeah, any of those ways and uh, would love to love to talk to anybody that's thinking about launching a brand or has launched a brand that, that thinks that, that they could benefit from this. Awesome. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, it was insightful. It was good. And uh, you have a really good rest of your day, my friend. 
Awesome. Appreciate you having me on, bud. Take care.